नमस्कार गोपाल जी वेलकम वेलकम एंड थैंक यू सो मच फॉर मेकिंग द टाइम टू बी पार्ट ऑफ अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन सो एज विद एवरी वन एल्स वॉट इज योर अर्लीस्ट रेकलेक्शन either of non violence or actually of violence because i know you were about 4 years old on the day that gandhi ji was killed i was 2 uh, and a half and i have no memories uh, of uh, the assassination but i have uh, memories of uh, what happened in the aftermath of the assassination in terms of um, photographs that uh, Well, everywhere uh, where we were, and in terms of the conversation, and so I think at that age, to have seen uh, pictures of uh, someone as close as one's grandfather, though I did not quite remember him then, uh, bearing uh, marks and injury, was uh, I should say deeply ingrained for all time. Um, i should say that my first image of gandhi is the image of the slain gandhi the gandhi who is lying prone uh, with a bullet mark somewhere and so um, the fact of violence and fact of violence uh, against uh, a very gentle person who had no uh, uh, arms on him was unarmed is 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 really the first uh, first memory i have i have of him and then the discussions uh, around him as i as i grew old i heard the name of his assassin and uh, i must say for a very long time in my mind though nobody really instilled th- uh, that um, uh, thought in me in my mind uh, the name and uh, uh, reference to nathuram gurdse was like a reference to somebody who had done incalculable harm and who would normally normally uh, home language be regarded as a person who uh, bore ill will uh, to my family and uh, to this this person whom everybody regarded uh, as the head of the family and uh, loving head of the family and so uh, nobody tried to villainize nathuram gurdse but my own mind saw him in the, in those black and white pictures but then still later uh, when i learned that two of my uncles um, uh, manilal and harib and little later ramdas had reacted in different ways i try to see what that means so i must start with the eldest son harila who was a rebel son and all these things are things which i got to understand much later in life but he was a rebel son uh, and living his own life on his own terms and living quite far away from his father it is said and without any hard evidence not material evidence in a, in a historical sense but it is said and this has been recorded that in bombay where he was he heard this and his first reaction was an absolute what can be called a, a, a reaction that is to be expected in a son he just he said i will murder the man who has killed my father i will murder the man who has killed my father that was harilal's instant reflexive reaction the second son manila and the third son ramdas who were with the father over different periods of time and who had uh, not only not rebelled against the father but who who had imbibed his their father's ethic uh, on non violence and ahimsa their reaction was different it is not what can be called the spontaneous reaction of a son it was a considered reaction of a philosophical and uh, um, conceptual legacy and their reaction was that the man who has shot our father should not be 
hanged because capital punishment was known as the standard punishment for murder. Their reaction was a considered reaction. It had gone through the filter of uh, philosophical training from their father. And they appealed in writing to the head of state, to the governor general of India, saying that they do not want Godse to be hanged. Uh, their appeal was not accepted by the governor general, by the prime minister and the home minister. None of them could accept the, the, the appeal. And Rathuram Godse was the first person and his colleague, associate, Apti, was the second person to be hanged in free India. This is an irony of ironies. Because there is absolutely no doubt that Gandhiji would not have wanted anybody who has assaulted him to be punished, much less hanged. Of course, there was no question of his having expressed himself because in his case, the receiving of the bullets and the dying was all instantaneous. But I have no doubt and nobody who has any uh, inkling of his thinking, no doubt at all that uh, he forgave the person at the very moment that he felt the injury. And he had no time to respond, but I'm sure in his mind he did. And why do I say this? And but before I come to that, let me also say that I have tremendous respect for Harilal's response, because it was a very natural response, the response of a son to his father's assassination. And he, he, for Harilal, his father was his father. He was not this saint, the Mahatma. He was just his father's son, just 19 years younger. We should remember that. He was just 19 years younger. And this was his reaction. So I, I must say that his was not an inferior response. It was his own response. And it has its own place. It has its own place. But I think its place lies in the fact that it showed the enormity of that murder, the horror of that murder, what it did. It extinguished not just one life, it extinguished the hope that had sustained so many people who had suffered in the partition of India, those who had gone across in Pakistan at Gandhi's own instance. And those who had come from Pakistan, whom Gandhi was saying, that there's a life for you here. So he was the hope for so many people. And that hope had been extinguished. So it was a horrible murder. And Harila's reaction is important because it just shows the horror of that act. But Manilal and Ramdas, by saying what they did, they went one step further to sublimate that reaction and to say that an evil act cannot be mitigated by another act which is also fundamentally violent. And that makes me think very quickly of a hanging that took place in the United States. It is not often known that the first woman to be ever hanged in the United States was Mary Surratt, who was found guilty of collaborating with the assassin of Abraham Lincoln. And there is a great deal of material to show that Mary Surratt was innocent. She was the owner of an inn, of a lodge, where the assassin had lived for a few days, and she was hanged. And I have no doubt that Lincoln and Gandhi, from where they are, would have looked upon these two executions with um, enormous anguish. So I just want to respond to what you said about my earliest memories and this of my 
Kaka, as we call him in Gujarati, Harinal Kaka. I would hug him for his response, being the natural response, and I would touch the feet of Manilal and Ramdas for what they did, which I understood much later in my life. Uh, can we go back to the South Africa years? You have recently written a book uh, which uh, gives us additional, which brings together additional biographical material on Gandhiji in, with a particular focus on the South Africa years. Uh, and you have spoken so eloquently about that moment when he was evicted from the train in Pieter Martsburg. Uh, what are some of the essential ingredients that shaped a most ordinary person into a uh, somebody who, in a very scientific way, uh, could live and live non-violence uh, or at least attempt to live non-violence and to deploy it politically? I think at, at this point, uh, one, one must mention uh, the, uh, the philosophy behind this. I do not uh, know how Gandhi's instinctive, intuitive um, embracing of Ahimsa started. I do not know the biochemical process. I do not know uh, enough psychology to say that it, it, it must have started with some incident in his lifetime. But I do know this, that uh, somewhere in his mind, and he has said this, that he learned his nonviolence from his own violence to his wife, Kasturba. And he says that she is the person is not his exact words, but something to this effect, that he learned his non-violence from her because she stood up to him. It is important here to know that they were both of the same age. Just as it is important to know that Harilal was only 19 years younger than his parents, it is important to know that Kasturba was his, aim, his, his exact age, in fact, a few months older. So she and she had known this child husband of hers from the time when they were both 13. So she has known him as a child. And being a girl, she has had the maturity that comes with femininity, that comes with being a female. And seeing this young boy become her husband. And also being, as he has said, jealous of her. You see, everything that can be spoken of and should be spoken of critically of Gandhi is based on things which Gandhi has himself said about himself. It is Gandhi's descriptions of his own failings and weaknesses that give us the reason and the material for judging him critically. And so he says that he was jealous of his wife. He was afraid of the dark. He was afraid of creepy crawlies. He was afraid of snakes and serpents. She was not. And she would go out whenever she wanted to. And he said, you can't go without my permission. And she said, I, I can picture her saying it in choice Gujarati. Mind your business. And she went ahead and did what she wanted to. And then he was, and he says, and this is from him. He says, I broke her bangles. I sent her back to her home, to her parents' home, and I would not talk to her. I mean, can you imagine a 13, 14, we know 13, 14, 15 year old girls. Imagine their bangles being broken by their husbands in jails. So he has that sense. And then he comes to understand how horrible that was. So he knows that violence does violence not merely to the person's physical presence or reality, but to the person's mind. And nobody can be more precious to a person, especially to a, a person who's been married so young, as his wife. And he goes with that sense of the utter wrong that violence involves. And so when somebody does violence to him, he sees it 
as she saw it. She didn't return violence for violence. She returned violence with a kind of moral force. Later in life, he does speak of Kasturba's very strong, biting, ferocious language. She gave it back to him in words. And he says that she spoke to me um, in, in terms, I will leave it to the reader of this book to describe, to, to, to read his own, Gandhi's descriptions of Kasturba's language. But it came from moral force. When Kasturba retaliated verbally to Gandhi, it came from a higher plinth, a plinth of suffering. When she told him that what he was doing was just not on. And this is how Gandhi reacted to the violence done to him in South Africa. The Pierre Maritzberg instance, which you refer to, is well known. Less known is the violence that was done to Gandhi when he uh, came back to South Africa a little later on after a visit to India, where he had published this tract called the Green Pamphlet, in which he described what uh, uh, was happening to this Indian community in South Africa. And some of the whites in Durban had decided to uh, block Gandhi's return. And when he, when he landed with Kasturba and the children, and he was walking alone, he was set upon. And uh, Rajini, I, I cannot um, <laughs> relate this without some difficulty because he was not given to exaggeration. There is, uh, one can fault Gandhi in, in quite a few matters, but you can't say that he exaggerated anything. But he says that his turban was snatched, he was beaten, he was kicked, he was slapped, he had stones, brickbats, and eggs hurled on him. Now, these are his exact words. Beaten, kicked, slapped by a mob of white youth. And then he hung on to railings of the house. And he says uh, he would have fallen unconscious were it not for the police commissioner's wife Jane Alexander, who came, who saw this and intervened. And then the most important thing, he says, even then I remember that in my mind, I did not arraign my assailants. This is extraordinary. He's in his mid twenties and he's being beaten black and blue. And he says, I knew in my mind, I did not arraign my assailants. And then this news spreads. And the British government tells the government of Natal to prosecute the assailants. And the Attorney General, Harry Escon, meets Gandhi and says, please give me a complaint against those who assail. And Gandhi, with all his bandages, says, I have no intention of complaining against those who assail me. Because, and these are his words, I have no doubt that they did what they did out of a misapprehension of my intentions. Just imagine, this is his non-violence. And it started in South Africa. Of course, Peter Maritzburg is famous. But Durban, this incident, is in terms of the uh, way his nonviolence unfolds at another level altogether. But if I can just go back to that moment when he's very new in South Africa, he's not had much success in the worldly realm in life till then. He's uh, there on a short term assignment. Uh, he's a stranger in a strange country and he's thrown off that train. Uh, 
because I know you have written about that, you have spoken about that. You know, if you, I would like you to, uh, in a sense, retell that story with young people today in mind. Because on a daily basis, young people are having to deal with those kinds of experiences, not in a literal sense, but in terms of the essence of the injury that Gandhi experienced that night of being thrown off that train just because he was brown skinned. Uh, what, what is the transformation that you, you think happened that night? Because something did change or something did emerge from within. Um, and what can we learn from it today for our immediate struggles? I think that is very important. Um, there was a, a dramatic moment, there's no doubt at all, uh, in Peter Mads, uh, and But he described it uh, really in the most undramatic terms. So if, you, if you see uh, the great film, The uh, Making of the Mahatma, Shambhala, it starts with that scene. And, and uh, the, the speech in Peter Meisberg that I made that you refer to, also I have um, uh, fully uh, utilized the, the dramatic uh, voltage of that moment. But he describes the whole thing in less than two sentences. The, his phrase for what happened, you know, we have heard the phrase, he was thrown out of the train. He was pushed out of the train. He just says, I was put out. I was put out. This is in translation, which is his own because he read the translation. I was put out. That's all that he says. And he doesn't say, and I must say here, it's, and when you talk about the present, I was describing this. This is something that happened to my grandfather, if I may describe him that, without uh, sounding possessive. This is something which happened to my dad. And I happen to be describing this to my granddaughter. For me, being a grandfather is the greatest promotion of my life. Having all my life been a grandson and nothing more than a grandson. Grandfather is, is a huge liberation and a promotion. But Reggie, I was describing that episode to my granddaughter. And this is at the heart of Ahimsa. And she's all of eight now. She was then six. And she's asked me, she said, so he fell down? I said, yes, he fell down. So was he hurt? I said, he does not say so, but I'm sure he was hurt. Then she said, what did he say to the man who threw him down? So I don't know. He has not said it. He has not said what he told that man after me, because he just says the train steamed away. So I, but I had to tell my granddaughter something. I couldn't tell her there is something called ahimsa, there is something called non-violence, there is something called exaggeration. I couldn't tell her all that. I didn't want to complicate life for her. So I just told her. I said I, I don't know what he said, but he must have said something like that was very naughty of you. Don't do that to anybody else. And that made some sense to her. I said, it was naughty of you. Don't. So to a child, I had to explain it like that. So when she's older, I'd have to I'd explain it a little further. But to her, I had to tell her that there was the only way I could describe his nonviolence is to tell her what I think he might have felt at the most. Don't do this to anybody else. You have done this to me. But before this episode was the Pagri episode in Durban, in the court, when he was asked by the magistrate to remove his Pagri. This is before the Peter Maritzburg episode, the week before the Peter Maritzburg. He goes to the court just to see the sessions. He's taken by his host, Dada Abdullah. And he says, the magistrate kept staring at me. I was wearing the Bengali style Pagri. And then he asked me to remove the Pagri. And that I would not do. So I just left the court. So when you are humiliated, you don't cop out of it by removing the pagri and say, you don't want me to wear a pagri? Okay, I'll take it out. It's very non-violent of me. Not at all. Non-violence is not the acceptance of humiliation. It is the reaction 
to a humiliation that is morally higher than a tit for tat. If he had said, I will not remove it and I'll continue to sit here, that would have been not non-violent. Or if he had removed it and continued to sit, that also would. He kept it on, but he left the court. He would not allow himself, his Indian pride, his human respect to be compromised. He left. And he wrote a letter to the editor of, immediately describing what had happened. And then, Rajni, I have to say this because it is not so known. He refused to remove the turban and went off, left with his self-respect intact. And he said in a letter to the editor, which he wrote, that I had no intention of uh, causing any disrespect to his worship, to his lordship. And I'm sorry if he has taken it otherwise, I apologize to him, but I had no such intention. But then later, when he's enrolled as a lawyer, the judge who administered the oaths of his new office to him said, Mr. Gandhi, now you may remove your turban. So what does he do? He has been enrolled. And this is not known, but it is important to know this. He removed his turban. And he explained the reason for it. He said, in Durban, when I was asked to remove my turban, I was just an individual. I was just an Indian in the court, a visitor who was asked to remove his normal cultural headgear. I refused. But now I'm an officer of the court. As a lawyer, I am bound by the protocol of this court. And to keep my turban on as an officer of the court is not right. I will follow the protocol of this court as an officer of the court. And he removed his turban. And the same man who had taken him to this court, this time said, you didn't remove it then, you're removing it now. What is it? He said, you have to understand. There was a violence in the act in which I was being asked to remove it. Here there isn't. There would have been violence on my part if I'd insisted on bearing it. Because it was not the protocol of the court. Now, violence in our times is chronic. Violence has become chronic and endemic in our times. And there is no uh, ready rule, no ready reckoner about what is violence, what is non-violence. One has to forge a non-violent reaction to every situation afresh, afresh. Every provocation to ahimsa from himsa has to be responded to afresh. And in no way is Gandhi a permanent teacher of a method. He has told us that violence is evil. How it should be resisted depends entirely on the circumstances, place by place, situation by situation. And he is not judging us by his standards. He is judging us, I think, by our own uh, living response to every moment and every situation in solidarity with the principle of non-violence. He has shown us the principle. He has not laid down a code. So what would be some of the essential principles that today we might uh, apply if we were to bring it down to, uh, well, not quite a toolkit, but uh, some essential pathfinding values and principles, uh, what would you say? 
particularly to young people who want to who want to walk this path but they sometimes feel diffident about the how Rajni yeah. thank you for that i think it's very important that uh, you should you should ask this in the context of today uh, i i might give a couple of examples but i i would like to say this that um, um, the intention of the person who is provoking is the most important if the intention is to humiliate you to weaken you to demoralize you to also of course to hurt you if the intention is that then you have to see how the reaction should be but if the intention is not that if you are feeling hurt without the person having intended to hurt you then you have to see whether your ego is coming into play it's just that it has to just see every inter- so if somebody if you feel hurt or insulted at any situation you have to just see the proportion uh, is it my ego that has been hurt or is it my innate self respect my humanity that has been hurt if it is just my ego then there is no case for me to retaliate but if it is not my ego it is something else either me or my kind my calm or my dharm every something to do with me is being deliberately insulted and humiliated then i have to respond and then i have to respond non violent but i must say here that he has said repeatedly and he even said on that occasion which i described very graphically about his having been uh kicked and beaten and slapped he says in the same paragraph that me that if i had continued to be beaten meaning that if jane alexander with her parasol had not materialized as something sent by parmatma to save him then he says i might have slapped him back and might even have bitten him b i t t e n he says that these are his own words so in certain situations when you are being pulverized without any hatred for that person in just self defense he has said of himself i might even have slapped or bitten him and then later and fast forwarding in johannesburg on the subject of uh, satyagraha against fingerprints when the community was asked to give fingerprints to register and he said that fingerprinting is uh, only done for criminals in india we are not criminals we will not give fingerprints and so he mobilized a huge huge satyagraha and then when it was suggested to him that voluntary fingerprints can be given he said that's all right my objection was not just to the fingerprints but to the compulsion of giving fingerprints and so if i am asked to give my fingerprints voluntarily that's all right i will do so and when he made this change this pathan called meer alam this two three other pathans they hit him with iron rods on his head and he fell unconscious he actually fell unconscious they beat him with a cudgel as he was going to put his fingerprints said you had told us not to give fingerprints ab aap keh rahe hai ki fingerprints dijiye i am a pathan and he, and they left him for dead and he again says that i remember when i fell unconscious i just said hey ram i just said hey ram and then his son harilal bless him the same man harilal asks him so naturally within a few of this he said babu if i had been with you when you were being beaten by meer alam what should i have done and the father says to his son if you 
could not have thought rajini this is very important he said to harila if you could not have thought of a non violent way of protecting me you could have hit them to save your father so this is this is gandhi it is all about intention and it is all about reaction it is about what is he wanting to do to me and if i am to respond non violently that's the best but if i reach a situation when i can't and i have to bring in some physical force i should do so without hatred without hating that man but only resisting myself to save myself so it is nuanced ahimsa is a nuanced field it is a field of felt experience of lived experience and there is no it is not a dawai in a shishi it is a principle in one's mind which one has to apply creatively every time so one is not to judge a person merely because she or he has used physical force to save herself or himself or to save his own or her own family or community it is not that it is just the way it is done and i just we have just 5 or 7 minutes more i want to fast track this is of course outside this book because this book ends with 1914 the south africa period but in delhi when he was fasting his last fast for communal harmony and that was being done at the time when thousands of refugees from what has now become pakistan had come from west punjab and they had lost everything they had lost their wives their children their daughters they had lost their everything including one and here they were gandhi is fasting for communal unity so pandit nehru who is the prime minister has come to talk to gandhi and he is saying to him bapu you are fasting i am in charge sardar patel is in charge we are trying to do whatever we can to maintain law and order you are fasting that's that's all right but you are unfair to us your fast has made it more difficult for us because now we are worried about you all so he said don't worry about me i am fasting because i can't do anything else so nehru leaves and as he leaves there's a group of anguished refugees each one of them with very good reason to be anguished and nehru heard the word from somebody mahatma gandhi in murdabad he is fasting and these people are anguished and the man who says this has suffered and he has some reason to say what he says mahatma gandhi and and nehru's reaction nehru never spoke of himself as a believer in non violence and ahimsa he, he he was all that but he he didn't he don't uh, see a sentence or a line by him saying uh, non violence is my creed or ahimsa parvadharma but what is his reaction then he pushed aside the whole thing he said getting us he got out again he said he kisne kaha kisne kaha mahatma gandhi murdabad silence and then after that, what does he say himmat hai to pehle mujhe maro pehle mujhe maro this one said to that such that is not violence there was no prescription there was no red book blue book or green book with nehru to say is page mein likha hai ki agar koi kahe mahatma gandhi murda ho to agle page ko dekho usme jawab dikha hai ki tumhe kya instant himmat hai to pehle mujhe maro and then harilal is a two lals harilal and jawahar there are two lals his lals one is his biological lal the other is his ideological lal then harilal says i will kill the man who killed my father in a way it is his own his heart speak and this is jawahar who said it is his heart speaking 
and he said pehle mujhe maar so that is not violence i am a very ineffective scholar rajni maine likhi ye compile kari ye kitab do teen aur bhi kari hai i have never faced physical violence it's it's a fact it's a meaningless fact i am 76 nearly and but there is violence all around us and we have to we have to see that the violence all around us of its many forms has to be responded to creatively and violence is not just about murdering killing hitting beating slapping it's also about when you lie you are being violent झूठ भी वायलेंस होती है इट्स बिकॉज इन यू इंसल्टिंग दैट पर्सन दैट पर्सन यू लाइक टू पर्सन यू आर इंसल्टिंग दैट पर्सन टू दैट पर्सन डिजर्व द ट्रूथ एंड हाउ डज वन रिस्पॉन्ड टू लाइज हाउ डज वन रिस्पॉन्ड टू पॉलिसीज एंड प्रोग्राम्स विच आर वायलेंट इट्स नो रेडी मेड आंसर दैट वन हैज टू जस्ट बी ट्रू टू वन सेल्फ वन हैज टू बी जस्ट ट्रू टू वन सेल्फ वन हैज टू जस्ट ट्रू टू वन सेल्फ What keeps you going? What gives you strength, and that others today, young people who have their whole working life, political life ahead of them, that you know, what can they do to build their strength in this respect? Because I think it's very clear that we are in for a very long haul. It's uh, okay. actually what keeps me going is this. This, this he just keeps me going. <laughs> just and the debt he owes to his wife. That is what keeps me going. Thank you, Rajini. थैंक यू आपको बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू एंड ऑल द बेस्ट ऑफ हेल्थ एंड वेल बी थैंक यू फॉर दिस ऑपरचुनिटी थैंक यू फॉर दिस ऑपरचुनिटी